Wallowing through the uncertainty of false righteousness, trailing fragment truth, the wind found me, dressed in awkward circumstance, moments of uncertain knowing, recognition with other kindred souls, reminding each other of past legend, even as we question our own knowing. We laugh now, passing time, sharing favored poems of favored poets immortalized to paper. It was words that led us to ritual, ritual leading to remembrance, awakening I went seeking others. Now we come again, announcing presence with signs and wonder. Night recedes. Sunrise on the Lips of Morning. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is FallenAngels.tv on blogtalkradio.com. I appreciate all of you that are taking this Sabbath time in your day to spend with me in fellowship as we delve and correspond over the deeper and more profound secrets of life and being and assist each other in coming to knowledge and knowing about the ancient mysteries and those things which are on the horizon that are quickly coming in preparing each other and our families for the uncertainties of this day and future tomorrows. It's a... Uh, I consider myself really blessed to have come to know many of you in the intimate way that I have, even though that a lot of us have never met, uh, never been even in the same state, or maybe not even in the same country, and yet with the remarkable capacity of the Internet and the connections that we can instantly call upon through Skype and these different radio shows that we do and sharing correspondence, the email, and being able to send message instantly to any part of the world without the need for postage and the time that it would take to, through snail mail, to send word and to, to write the letters that we used to in the way that we used to putting pen to paper and putting it in the mail and then over days and weeks having that message finally arrive and then um, in reply it would be a similar um, as far as time and effort and so for us to be able to instantaneously share and have dialogue is really just a blessing and in my mind significant of the time that we are in as far as being the last generation and being those that are going to be privy to all the secrets that everything will be revealed no no secrets and nothing left, uh, nothing new under the sun. And so everything is being brought to light, all of what seem to be, you know, even the most strangest, uh, most questionable, questionable aspects of truth and fairy tale and fantasy, that all the ancient mysteries, the oral traditions which have long been guarded and held secret by the various wisdom keepers of different indigenous peoples, Native American tribes, and um, uh, different high-level priests and shamans all over the world that even they are also recognizing the profoundness of where we are as world in the collective situation we find ourselves in, in being challenged daily by all the 
what seems to be the madness of world, the prevailing madness of world as the new world order and the powers that be, the wickedness, power, wickedness in high places, the powers, principalities, and the rulers of darkness and the fallen angels, the return of the Nephilim, the ancient aliens, the fallen angels, whatever it is you want to call them. It's everywhere. We're being bombarded left and right now by depictions and you know, Hollywood movie and the symbology that are associated with all of these things. And so whether you are new to this information, whether you are new to um, aspects of Bible prophecy and to biblical esoteria, it seems like the whole world is being asked to question again all the things that we thought we have known and that we have guaranteed or thought to be guaranteed as being reality. And so um, even now with the prevalence of shows that are connected to UFOs on the TV and to the Freemasons and secret societies. It seems like everywhere now on the history channels and on National Geographic and all these channels which used to um, kind of shy away from such introspection and for entertaining those kind of possibilities, it's everywhere now, even on, you know, the mainstream news channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC, and all of the other uh, channels are also getting in on the interest that the people, the masses, and the populaces everywhere in the world are exhibiting in being hungry and seeking and yearning for answers, guidance, and direction for such knowledge. And so for that, I'm, I'm very grateful because it the broad awakening is also appealing to the youth of the world. And for many years until recently, uh, I didn't know really what was going to awaken the youth to want to do something other than just playing the video games, you know, and already they had left being interested in reading and in books as um, tools for knowledge and learning that, you know, schools and the curriculum was just a matter of temporary, short-term um, memory and memorizing this and that for certain tests, but not really learning anything. And, of course, the educational systems, and especially here in America, that the New World Order and the powers that be, that they had done that on purpose so that, you know, they dumbed down um the children and the youth and that that interest in learning and that they fed us just a bunch of nonsense, things that were meaningless to, to life and the survival and the pursuit of anything other than the American dream, money and materialism, a good job and being a good taxpayer and supporting the, the matrix and the system in those kind of ways. And so it's interesting to me to see the youth so hungry for answers and for knowledge, for guidance, real guidance, and that when you can tie uh, the things that are being spoken about on all these various programs about, you know, the ancient aliens, the fallen angels, the giants, the... Uh, the the Nakash, dragons, mythology, the feathered serpent, all these different things. And you can point to the scriptures 
and show them that these things are contained therein, they're they're more than apt and more than willing to to read again those things which they thought were just worthless. Because that's why the youth has not for so long written the uh, read the gospels, is because they thought that it was meaningless for their lives, and that it was an, antiquated and you know just didn't concern them and didn't um, didn't have anything for them as far as substance. But when they understand and when they see that, you know, basically the gospel is, um, shows going back to the war in heaven, the the differences between the sons of God and the sons of light and the a war between the sons of Belial and the sons of darkness, and that those connections are to the ancient aliens and to the giants and to you know, when when you can show them all those things and uh, and verify it with the gospel and with the word, they are hungry in a way that is just it, it gives me great hope. It makes me uh, it brings me great joy to see others just wanting to know the way that I have for so long and so. It's a um, it's a beautiful blessing to be alive in the time that we are, and to see so many um, turning again to the Word and to the Gospel for you know that guidance and that direction that that they are not finding in the mainstream churches because not still you know ninety percent of the pastors, the preachers, and the ministers they they're not covering these things. And so today we're going to be covering another one of those topics which are little understood and which are little delved into as far as mainstream churchianity. And this has to do with election and to do with why it is we find ourselves in specific embodiment and personal situation and circumstance you know whether whatever the reason and this includes disability why you're born into certain families in certain countries under certain relation uh religion certain um certain you know governments influence and so cuz no matter where you are the father and the son have put you into circumstance and situation that they thought would be the most beneficial for your coming to knowledge and coming to truth. And I know that for a lot of us over most of our lives to understand that, but in my opinion, um, once... Once you can see the larger picture and you can understand or kind of understand why the Most High would allow things to be in the ways that they are and that we can grasp minutely the what is the greater purpose, the larger picture and the more profound revelation for our lives, that these kind of things then make sense. And I know that, you know, probably 70% of the people will never, even in their entire lifetime, see it as such. And that even the elites, those that are part of the globalists and those bloodlines which are born into uh, the Illuminati blood and, and these royal families, we all think that, or most of the world thinks that they they have it easy, and oh, why you know why couldn't that be us? But the kind of schizophrenic nature and the kind of abuse and the kind of um, 
Well, the coldness, the callousness by which these these elitists raise their children, and often that they are involved in very abusive situations. We don't see that from the outside, and we see well, all we see is the uh, fairy tale side of it, you know. But if you watch a movie called The Crown Killers, then you get an idea for how insane these people are, and how just cold and devilishly calculated. They are in raising their children in a callous manner, in trying to conform them to evil, and their early uh, indoctrination into black magic and ritual, and to um, abuse of a physical, mental, and emotional, and even a sexual nature. And we can't even fathom the kind of insanity that some of these children are raised in. And so I would not wish that upon anybody. Um, but anyway, so today we're gonna I'm gonna be reading from and alluding to just a little bit of one of the chapters of my book which is concerned with election, and I'm going to be explaining also why it was that the Father, the Most High, says in the Gospel that Jacob of love, the Esau, I hate it. Because again, this is something that us you understand and election, pre-election, and how it ties to what we're speaking about now as far as embodiment, circumstance, and situation for lifetime and being. Unless you can understand those connections, it's really impossible to explain these particular passages and their relation to what we all consider to be a loving and a just God. Because how is it that we can have a compassionate, loving, and, and a God that rules by law and order and justice that could hate a child that had not yet even been born, that had not even had chance to determine his allegiance to either good or evil, and that had not yet even sinned to deserve such recognition and such an extreme uh, as far as predicament and animosity you know so these things will tie to that and I I will get to that chapter but I want to before I do so I'm going to share with you um an email that I recently received from Kevin Ronsky, who is uh, lives up in Canada, and he just recently read Skyfall. And he's been very interested in receiving this book for quite a long time now. But I, I just wanted to share with you this email um, because I, I thought it would be encouraging for others. And he says this. And then we'll go into the topic of today. I just finished Skyfall. Great job, then. Certainly my favorite book so far of the bunch. And he, he's read all of them. So um, I actually thought the others were better. But, you know, certain ones will appeal to certain people depending on their research and the focus of what they are trying to come to understanding upon. But... I also, I you know, I believe Skyfall is is going to help a lot of people in answering a lot of uh, what they have been seeking answers upon for a long time. But anyways, continuing. 
Certainly my favorite book so far of the bunch. Not only is it awesome for people with similar discernment and gives us further teaching and keys for further unlocks, but it will serve well in also, and here's the different points that he brings up, in also getting the once saved all folks to reconsider and encourage saints to not be satisfied with the entry level but to want to do as much as possible in terms of kingdom work and the Father's business. It will also serve well in encouraging New Agers to not get sucked into believing the ancient alien strong delusion and also in believing in reincarnation. It will also serve others in getting people to understand the harsh realities regarding the seed of the serpent uh, he says you did a really good job summarizing that for folks who did not read Lucifer, Father, or Cain. Either way, really worthwhile and in, in The neatest part of all was actually the fact that before I started reading Skyfall, I had been praying to God to help me name my small ministry and actually receive the ministry name while reading your book. When you reference two Thessalonians, the brightening brightness of his coming. And so, anyways, God bless you, brother. Thank you for all that you do in his service. Um, I appreciate those of you that do take the time to to write to me and, and to share with me the different emails that you do. And as part of show, I'm going to be sharing some of those. I actually, in the next show, I'm going to share some um, some correspondence that I've had with Colleen Warden, which she shared some just really uh, beautiful what are confirmations for my my life because I'm you know I'm learning from all of you as well, and the things that you are sharing with me is is also being being confirming witness for me in the discernment that I feel that the Father and the Son have led me. Uh, to come to revelation upon. And so with so many of you coming out of the woodworks in the way that you are in finding, you know, someone else that thinks um, that has similar research as to what you are also being led to, well, that's all, you know, uh, that's all a blessing for all of us because it's out of the mouths of two or three witnesses shall the truth be established. And this thing, as far as um, speaking about the prior times and pre-existence and predestination, this is something that still is not well delved into and is not absolutely not well received by uh, those that... Um, have not been exposed to or are not embracing such information. And so um, we're, we're all being confirming witness for each other, and we're helping each other to come to remembrance. And one other thing as far as remembrance, even though I've been led to a general understanding as far as um, having instant knowing and having the the Holy Spirit being poured out on me and in reference to that particular topic and um, and that particular issue. I want to also encourage all of you to not be discouraged if you are not being led to remembrance in similar capacity or in similar way. That, you know, we are all... Um, coming to knowledge in different ways, but we are, you know, uh, being awakened by the Holy Spirit in different ways. And many of you are seeking remembrance and personal insight into your former estate, into your spiritual incarnation. And a lot of you are praying for that and sincerely and diligently and asking for the Father and the Son to to give you insight in that way, 
But I want to, you know, keep you encouraged so that you don't get down on yourself if if you are not being led in that kind of a way. If you're not being given a vision which is confirming for you in that way. That, you know, even with the things that I've learned, and I covered this on a previous show uh, on the Angels of Destiny in that show, I, I'm also not given exact detail on that our spiritual incarnations and, you know, what we look like or what we did or where we were or, you know, all the specifics of how we acted and behaved or performed uh, during the war in heaven. Uh, I'm, my insight is general, as I explained on that show. And, and there are those that are certainly given detailed information along those lines, but, you know, I, I still think that this is few and this is a minority and that um, we should not be discouraged if if you are praying and continue to pray, you know, for such confirmation. But don't get discouraged and don't beat yourself up in if you are not uh, being shown such revelation, up, at least up until this point. It may still yet come, but still, you know, go about the Father's business, seek the kingdom, make it a priority for your life. The Father and the Son will give you guidance and direction and give you the answers that you need. Um, and so... You know, don't just just keep your head up and look 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 to the skies for our redemption is nigh, um, and know that at any time th- that we must really be perpetually prepared, perpetually ready, and always seeking um, relationship with the Father and the Son because. You never know. We're not promised any tomorrows. We're not, you know, nothing in the future is not of any kind of a certainty. Uh, one other thing as well, because I know that a lot of people are caught up in worries about the past and also in um, stressing out over things that are not yet as far as the future and things that have not yet occurred but that and especially for uh, for women that my mother was a, a warrior and that I find that women in general because they are emotional beings that they have a tendency to focus on the stress of um things that happened in the past or things that are going to happen in the, in the future, and that it's difficult for individuals, both male and female, it's difficult for people to hold on to what's happening within the moment and to find your joy right here, right now. That, you know, with so much stress and with the difficulty of the times that we're living in, um, you know, and all the things with our children, with our loved ones, with our parents, and with family members, even our animals, the sick, or, uh, you know, some individuals, uh, you know, the the prevalence of, of cancer in the populations now, the just all the different aspects of of life, which are, you know, doom and gloom, even with uh, the impending, uh, whether the war, nuclear fallout, with even the Fukushima stuff, uh, with the genetic and modified foods, and with the poisons, the toxins being in the air and in the food and in the water, 
There's so much to worry about and so much to stress out on. If we really, if we allowed ourselves to always be focused on those things, that we would never get a moment of rest, of rest or respite or or a, a moment of sabbatical. And so try, if you can, and and I know this is a, a, a great skill for those that do have it, that are able to em, embrace the fragile sacredness of this moment now. And that if you can just cling to the promise, to the hope, and to the possibility of this moment now and try to find joy, try to find peace and serenity and and hope within this moment that all the other things will take care of themselves. That even if, you know, something bad in the future is going to happen, it's going to happen, but there's no sense allowing it to affect all your moments leading up to that. And that includes with things that have happened in our past that, you know, if we've been harmed or hurt or um, have had people wrong us, that even though it, you know, it irks us and that it consumes our thoughts and it, it weighs heavy on our mindset and that a lot of times it you know those kind of things repeat over and over in our heads and it's difficult to to let go to forgive and to move on from circumstances and situations such as that it, it's really it's better for us in in what is the perpetual moment now is blessed, the rest remembered, that if we can just hold on to and try to embrace this moment now and just remember, you know, that that at any time that really this moment that we're sharing with each other, that we could be the last people we ever talk to, that the the people who come into your life in the every moment of every day, that that might be the last person you ever see, that this might be the last chance you ever have to hug your 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 children, your wife, your spouses, your your loved ones, your parents, that this might be the last person you ever meet, that these kind of things are really really relevant, and it's. And I know it's a difficult thing for a lot of people, especially right now with the heaviness of life and situation, with all the stresses bearing down on us and all the impending gloom and doom that really, it's like Atlas with the world on our shoulders. If we allow it to be like that all the time. But I myself, I, I try to take notice of just the awesomeness of creation and the blessings of every day, of every moment, and just being alive. You know, even with the chance to eat, the, to have new meal, to, to drink the water and to breathe the air and to be witness to another sunrise and sunset, the unfolding of another day, the oncoming um, blooming of spring and the sound of the birds and the crickets and the cicadas, all these little things, you know, and I know that it's easier for a poet like myself to, that we're more sensitive to those kind of things and that we seek within nature and within the moment, within every day, the beauty it's just I find it humbling 
to be alive and to make it to another day. And I give thanks to the Creator, to the Most High, and to the Son for just everything that comes to my life. You know, the being able to eat another meal, to share conversation with friends, to even to be able to do this radio program where I can have outreach with all of you to be able to share more insight and share knowledge and share wisdom to help others in their seeking to you know, assist them in their research i mean all those things are are just true blessings and i know again the last time i know it's difficult for for people to live like that and that you know the the world teaches us to to kind of worry about things and to stress over money and our bills and our situations, but that we should take more time to smell the roses, so to speak. All right. We're going to go ahead and go into, I'm just going to read a few paragraphs and passages from what is, this is chapter 10 of my latest book, Skyfall. The Angels of Destiny, and this chapter is entitled, Jacob Have I Loved, But Esau Have I Hated. And this will cover in detail for those that study and read this book later, election and preexistence and our predestination and how all those things are embodied in who we are now and how we came to be uh, in the lives and embodiments that we find ourselves in. All right. How is it possible that our Father in Heaven could hate a child that has yet to come into world? How could a loving and just God enunciate into Scripture extreme angst against an as yet unborn and innocent child? What are the later followers of the gospel to think about such a pronouncement? What, if anything, could really justify such animosity? Are we to believe that the same God that made a covenant with our forefathers and promised us deliverance and salvation to eternal life through his Son, Yeshua, Savior, Messiah, is the same God that could declare hatred for an as yet unborn child? These are some of the questions that reflect upon the minds of people when reading about Yahuwah hating Esau before he had ever been born. These questions can only be answered by those issues that never get addressed directly by mainstream pastors, ministers, and preachers who maybe are too afraid to malign the most high when trying to explain this topic. Most do not want to put themselves out on a limb in attempting to address the implausible nature of these questions, especially when that child seemingly remains innocent of any action which could warrant such an extreme declaration. And because they have no explanation for the passages we are about to address, These scriptures never get brought up in the mainstream churches. It takes understanding predestination, pre-election, and how they fit into the revelation of these scriptures to interpret them in a new light and unlock their true meanings in such way that they actually make sense. Romans chapter 9, verse 11 through 14. For the children... Being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Those that cannot grasp the veiled nature of this scripture and its connection to events that occurred while we were in spiritual embodiment may have a difficult time understanding the context 
of this and other verses which are also connected to these teachings. Many ask the question, is it fair for the father to have loved Jacob and hated Esau when neither had yet even been born, especially considering that they were sired by the same mother and father? How is it that a loving, benevolent, kind-hearted God, the creator of the universe and all beings, could be cited in the gospel as hating one child and favoring another when neither had chance to grow up to warrant favor in such capacity that would justify either love or hate? To understand this issue, in fullness, it must be associated to our former state and why it is that we find ourselves in our current fleshly incarnation. Unless one can envision the bigger picture of how our first incarnation and actions there in the first world age and spiritual and dimensional realities affect consequences for our current second world age embodiment. One would be at a loss trying to comprehend what makes some favored and others hated. This passage from Romans 9 in its full context speaks about not just Esau, but also Ishmael and correlates Abraham as being the father of both Isaac and Ishmael, with Isaac being the father of both Jacob and Esau. The only difference in both sets of children is that in Abraham's case, they are from different mothers, but in Isaac's case, they have the same mother and father. The passage in full. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham, But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also has conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children not being being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the things formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering? the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, 
not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he has said also in Osi, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. All right. I'm only going to read a little bit more of this particular um, chapter, and then I'm just going to go to a few scriptures that I want to share with you, and I'll just make commentary, because I know we're going to quickly run out of time, as we always do. Election as a topic is not covered in great detail within the context of the Old or New Testament, but it is covered in such a way that when understood, it helps one to understand how vitally important predestination and pre-election are for unlocking certain passages which also weigh heavily on them as a skeleton key for unlocking concepts and aspects of the gospel which will remain veiled without them. Knowledge that we were pre-existent spiritual beings who had embodiment prior to entrance into flesh can assist one in grasping other parts of the Holy Word which are not taught by most and that do not understand the importance of election as a topic. Another passage from Malachi, chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall cut them. The border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Now, another passage which is connected to um, Esau and you know Ishmael and also Cain, and how these particular bloodlines are to be hated by the Most High, is Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, actually it's Isaiah chapter 14, speaks about Lucifer as being the abominable branch. And that uh, it says, prepare slaughter for his children that they do not inherit the cities. So he's speaking about the, those the Cainites, that are found in Genesis chapter 4, that are excluded from the line of Adam, found in Genesis chapter 5, and that um, this election and why you know certain people would be born of those particular lines, it has to do with our preexistence and our election. So continuing. Election is, in my opinion, Vital for clarifying the topic of how innocent and unborn children could be favored or hated prior to coming to conception. In my mind, this explains the issue without question. Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael, like us, pre-existed with the Father and the Son and had spiritual lives where they were also part of the First World Age. They too were included in the Divine Council of Elohim, or the sons of God, and also had part to play in the war in heaven that led to the separation of light and darkness and the defining of forces of good and evil. The roles that were assumed during that time had great influence in determining role in what would be incarnation into the second world age and physical embodiment. Election determined that Isaac and Jacob would be favored and Ishmael and Esau would be hated. Sarah, Hagar, Rachel, and Eve would all be used by the Most High to sire children that would reflect enmity between the woman and the serpent. The circumstances of each coupling, though similar, differ in aspect. With Adam and Eve, the children have different fathers but the same mothers. 
In the case of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, the children would be born from the same father but have different mothers. And in the case of Isaac and Rachel, they would be born from the same father and mother. I think the Most High wanted to show that no matter the circumstances of mother and father, that children born into the born unto them could represent both the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, depending upon election and predestinated role for mission in life. Couple more paragraphs. Esau Having the same father as Jacob was hated not for being a serpent seed, which he was not, but because God foreknew he would marry into the serpent seed lineage and sire many enemies and generations of serpent seed children by other fathers. Esau would break the kind after its kind rule and, as mentioned, establish his loyalty to serve the dark side as a spirit soul prior to his flesh embodiment. Those that would be hated, such as Cain, Ishmael, and Esau, would enter this life representing the usurpers and wayward spirits that rebelled against God, dedicating self to evil and allegiance to their father and God, Satan. Abel, Seth, Isaac, and Jacob, as those fathered by Yahuwah, signify benevolence and dedication to the Most High in such way that they would be chosen for a preferred role during what would become next assignment while in flesh embodiment. Election was the determining factor that established why some would be hated and some favored before any had ever even been conceived into the womb of their mothers. Determined by choices made while in our first world age, spiritual embodiments, elections aligned us to either good or evil, setting circumstance which established scenario for life and being. In my previous books and works, I expound upon the war in heaven and how one-third of the angels of the Most High rebelled against his son, Yahushua, inciting with Lucifer in his attempt for self-rule and glory. A third remained loyal to the original Morning Star administration, joining Michael and the cherubim forces in their fight to ward off Satan's rebellion. Another one-third were caught up in such perplexity that they made no decision choice to act one way or the other in taking sides during the ensuing war. Confused as to which side to support and how to act, like the Laodicean church of this day and age, some were uncertain as to what to do and therefore did nothing in clarifying allegiance to good or evil in a definitive and meaningful way. This was the major dilemma which predicated that the majority of these angels would be signed tasked with incarnating into flesh form. They, we, would be given renewed chance for what would be fresh opportunity for determining allegiance to either Yeshua or Satan. The second world age and entrance into fallen flesh embodiment would be the proving grounds for that determination as all whom would incarnate into this fallen world would be given chance again for redemption and for deciding service to either one or two masters. This is important, so pay close attention here. Those that sit on the fence during this embodiment, those who make no decision one way or the other, those that are cited as being lukewarm, will be spewed out and counted among those excluded from the book of life. One cannot remain on middle ground in this lifetime. It is critical for eternal security that one choose and act upon the choice to serve the Father and the Son 
while there is still time. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Last paragraph here. Like Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, those that find themselves in flesh form now are and were part of the angels that were witness to the unveiling of Christ as light of the world. We were, as the sons of God, also witness to the revealing of Christ as this light of the world. We're also parcel to the rebellion of Lucifer and the temptation of the angels of the Most High and subsequent war in heaven. If required to enter into flesh embodiment, it would be our decision during that time which would determine election for mission during this lifetime. Every choice we make now with our every instance, thought, act, and deed while embroiled in worldly affairs will determine course of whether we will be worthy of the salvation and the eternal life extended to all by the sacrifice of Christ to those taking from taking form in this world. It would be Yeshua's prerogative as head of the Morning Star administration to enter into the second world age and example to us all as the fallen sons of God what it is that we must do and how it is that we must live to be counted among those worthy of a return to our first estate and escaping the entrapments of this carnal world. It would be his immaculate conception and virgin birth which would prove to world and all history how Yahuwah as our Father in heaven and creator of us all has been and always will be in charge of all things since even prior to what became the foundations for the inception of this flesh world. The plan of salvation and the incarnation of Christ into the flesh has and had been known to the Most High before even the fall of Adam and Eve and their seduction by Satan, the fallen cherub. The birth, life, and death of the Messiah had even been encoded into the heavenly eons before the stars, planets, and constellations had reached the necessary position to herald his birth, life, death, and resurrection. The entire creation bears witness to our Father's love of humanity and the sacrifice of His only begotten Son to redeem the sins of this world. All right. I want to read a particular passage, a scripture from 1 Corinthians. Let me check the chat room real quick. Just want to make sure that there are no um, no questions being circulated that I miss. All right. I'm going to read this particular quotation. It says this. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. 
And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have been have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall we be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this particular passage is speaking about the corruptible body, the natural body, and the spiritual body. And that when we came into flesh embodiment, it was a marriage of the spirit with that of of the natural, the dust of the earth that our bodies are made of. But that our spiritual bodies were not created then. Our spiritual bodies pre-existed. And that when we came into the flesh, Our souls were not just then made, even though our bodies had just then been made, and that through the natural processes of procreation, that we were given vehicles, that the body is the armor of soul, of spirit, but that this is not when we initially first come into existence. That even energy, and and the scientists know this, that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. That it just simply transforms and, and can be housed and contained by different shapes and embodiments. That even water can take on solid liquid, or vapor. And that our souls being housed in the flesh, that when we die, the body goes back to the ground, but our spirits go on to paradise or to Sheol, depending on your focus and your behavior and your works and the things that you did while you were here in the flesh. But that just as our spirits go on afterwards, so did we come prior to that embodiment from somewhere else. And so I've played for for those of you that are um, not new to my show, I I played a, a small clip called The Creation of Souls, which I'm going to play it now. It's only a few minutes long. But this particular short story is from a book of Jewish lore. Old, ancient, 4,000-year-old fables. uh, Short stories. And that in this particular book that I found when I was working on this book, Skyfall, and the Father led me to this information to be confirming witness to the revelation that I was then working on and the what I was going to be sharing as far as discernment within this new book, Skyfall. And even though this is just a very small, short story and that a lot of people don't believe that there's any truth or any kind of relevancy to you know, some of the fairy tales or the uh, the old 
forgotten lore, the ancient mysteries. In my opinion, there's a, a lot of truth into what becomes fairy tale, fantasy, mythology, that a, the, a lot of those are based on truths which we have long forgotten. And so I'm going to share this with you real quick, and then we're going to continue. It's from, uh, for those that want to know, and, you know, if you want more information on this book, it comes from a book called 4,000 Years of Jewish Lore by a lady named Ellen Frankel, who's a Ph.D. Um, She gathered together, she spent a number of years gathering together all of these different short stories um, and and compiled them and put them into a book and published them. And and it's really incredible reading. Uh, Another thing which is of interest in her book that um, she published is that it also covers how Cain is a child of the serpent. And so, you know, that was also further confirmation as to the premise of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain. And I want to state one other thing as well. Um, For those that still are having difficulty with that as a topic, I share in this new book, Skyfall, in the very last chapter, about after uh, uh, the story of how after I had published that book, Lucifer, Father of Cain, my fourth book, Uh, that the father led me to a Bible code which confirmed in seven different matrices that particular information and that knowledge. And I share with you and I teach you in the last chapter of my seventh book, Skyfall, how you can look up and pull this Bible code out for yourself and confirm it as I did as far as the information and just the incredible nature of Bible code in confirming exactly what Christ spoke about as the tares being the children of the devil of the um, of the enemy that you know, snuck into the garden and and sowed his own seed. And that Christ also spoke about how that this was one of the secrets that had been hidden since the foundations of the world. And so, just wanted to share that with you. The creation of souls. Unlike the human body, which was created on the sixth day, the soul was created on the first day, before anything else in the world. In that first hour, God created all souls and placed them in the highest heaven where they remain until called to enter the body chosen for them. When a baby is conceived, Layla, the angel of night, brings the fertilized egg before God who decides its fate, whether it will be a boy or a girl, rich or poor, strong or weak, beautiful or ugly, fat or thin, wise or foolish. Only one decision does God leave in the hands of the unborn soul, whether it will be righteous or wicked. Then God sends the angels of souls to the highest heaven to bring back the soul destined for that particular body. Always the soul rebels, for compared to the celestial world, The lower world is but a poor place, full of sorrow. But God reprimands the rebellious soul, saying, Hush, for this is why I created you. And so the soul enters the unborn child and nestles quietly under the mother's breast. The next morning, a second angel carries the soul to paradise, where it sees all the righteous enjoying eternal happiness. If you follow God's Torah and live a worthy life, explains the angel, you will one day join these happy creatures here. But if not, and that night, 
the angel, takes the soul to the gates of Gehenna, where it sees the angels of destruction, whipping the wicked souls with burning lashes. Such is the fate of those who have devoted their lives to sin and cruelty, the angel says. It is for you to choose for yourself. Between morning and night of that day, the angel reveals to the unborn soul its future life, where it will live, where it will die, and where it will be buried. And then, at the end of the nine months, the angel announces that it is time for the soul to leave the warm refuge of the womb. Oh no, cries the soul, for that will be too much to bear. But the angel quickly silences it. So God has decreed, against your will you were formed, and against your will you will be born, and against your will one day die. Such is your fate. And with that, the angel strikes the newborn baby under the nose, leaving a small cleft there. Then he extinguishes the light shining above its head, and instantly the soul forgets everything it has learned during the previous nine months. And then the baby emerges into the world crying and afraid. Each soul spends the rest of its time on earth recovering all that it once knew. I thought that was a very interesting story. And so I also um, share that, that particular short story in its entirety in the earlier chapters of Skyfall when um, speaking about the pre-existence of humanity in our, you know, our spirit our spirits and I talk about how um, so many people believe that you know when we enter into the womb of our parents that that is when the spirit the soul is created and in my opinion it's absolutely not and for those that really study the gospel and, and, and other passages many of which I share in quotation as source material for this book, Skyfall, which is scattered through, you know, the many of its 300 plus pages. Um, that when you put it together in the way that I have in this book, it to me it becomes undeniable. I mean, it it just it there's so many other things which are reliant upon this knowledge um that just would not make sense even you know the the one that many are very familiar with Jeremiah chapter 1 where the word of the Lord goes to Jeremiah and tells him that I knew you before you ever entered into the womb of your mother I had foreordained you to be a prophet unto the nations um you know, for people that still don't embrace this as teaching, they're saying that that only occurred with Jeremiah, you know, or that Jeremiah is the only one that the the father knew before he came into the womb. When, to me, that it just does not make sense. Um, and the reason being is because I, I shared three or four other instances of that same kind of um, teaching being referred to in different scriptures, and not just the Old Testament, but you know the the pseudepigraphal, the apocryphal, and the many extra biblical texts that are found all through, even the Nag Hammadi codices. Many there's so much that is connected to this as discernment. All right. I'm going to um, just share a couple other passages. This one is also from the Apocryphon of John, uh, James. This is the 
Nag Hammadi codices, which most people consider to be Gnostic, and they say that they contradict the Bible and the Old New Testament, which in, in my mind they just provide greater detail. And uh, that people don't understand them, and because they don't understand them, they criticize those things that they most you know most people criticize them without even having read them. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. Um, here's the passage. It says, "They will ask you where you are going." This is Christ speaking to to John or to James. They will ask you where you are going. The answer, to the place from which I came. I return to that place. And so Christ is alluding to and referring to, again, our former estate, that we were also part of the sons of God, that we were part of the divine council, the Elohim, and that... um, And that's also what is being referred to in our returning to our first estate, our regaining our bright natures, our being established in immortality once again. Because it's the spirit that is immortal. It's not our bodies. Even though it says that, you know, at the end of days, our, our bodies will be resurrected again but that it's our spirits which are the connecting link that is the Father and the Son within us, that that part of us is God, and that um, that is what gives us consciousness. And when we enter into the flesh and enter into our bodies, that's what gives our bodies warmth. That's what is the breath of life that is was breathed into Adam's body. His That was the father putting Adam's spirit into that vessel, into that, that what would be the vessel for his spirit over his lifetime. Um, anyways... I want to just share this last particular passage with you, and this just has to do with what we're going to be dealing with as a people, what we're going to be dealing with as this final generation, and the kind of things that we're going to be seeing, and how the you know the love of truth, uh, there would be not many that truly understood, that have discernment on truth, and that it would be the blind leading the blind and that, you know, a lot of the pastors, the preachers, ministers, they would be uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. So a passage from the Ascension of Isaiah about our generation and even, you know, those that study the book of Enoch, in the early chapters, Enoch cites how when he wrote that book that it would be uh, for future generations that it would be for a people in the later the distant future and as the fig tree generation it's my opinion again that we are that generation and we are going to be the ones that see the conclusion of all these things and so to end the show I'm going to leave you with this passage from the ascension of Isaiah it says this And in those days, many will love office, though devoid of wisdom. And there will be many lawless elders and shepherds dealing wrongly by their own sheep. And they will ravage the meek, owing to their not having holy shepherds. And many will change the honor of the garments of the saints, for the garments of the covetous. And there will be much respect of persons in those days and lovers of the honor of this world. And there will be much slander and vainglory 
at the approach of the Lord and the Holy Spirit will withdraw from many. And there will not be in those days many prophets, nor those who speak trustworthy words, save one here and there in diverse places, on account of the spirit of error and fornication and of vainglory and of covetousness, which shall be in those who will be called the servants of that one and in those who will receive that one. And there will be great hatred in the shepherds and elders towards each other, for there will be great jealousy in the last days, for everyone will say what is pleasing in his own eyes. And there will make of none effect the prophecy of the prophets which were before me, and these my vision also will they make of none effect, in order to speak after the impulse of their own hearts. And is that not the truth? In my opinion, there's so many that are the elders, the leaders, the People that the flock, you know, the uh, the seekers are looking to for direction, for guidance, and that are seeking desperately answers to the deeper aspects of life and being. That want to know the esoteric secrets that are hidden, but which are veiled within the word, and that are not helping others to really understand the gospel in the way that, again, in my opinion, is meant to be understood. Because when you can read it in 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 way that um, it presents all of the secrets to you, oh, how much information, how much knowledge... How much wisdom is contained within the word? All of it. That it reveals all the secrets and that it helps us to understand what was in the past, where we are now and where we're going, who we were, why we came into the flesh, why we're here now, where we're going. All these things in my opinion, are veiled within the Word. And that when you are brought to discernment, that when you can understand what has been forgotten and lost and and little understood by most of the world, that you cannot be lied to, you cannot be led astray, you cannot, you will not be as most that are destroyed for lack of knowledge so anyways i'll i'll be on this wednesday evening join me please if you can revolution radio freedomslips.com um this month we're going to be having uh, dr joy and also professor truth joining us and um god bless all good night